Hello and welcome to Global Perspectives. I'm David Dumke here with Katie Coronado, my co-host. Today we are going to talk about the importance of the U.S.-Mexico relationship. We have with us Ambassador Tony Wayne, a veteran diplomat who served as U.S. Ambassador to Mexico City from 2011-2015 and currently serves as the co-chair of the advisory board of the Mexico Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Institute in Washington. Thank you for joining us today, Ambassador Wayne. It's a great pleasure to be with you, David and Katie. Thank you. So there's a lot of talk on the U.S.-Mexico relationship, on trade, on immigration, on a number of other aspects, security, narcotics. What is, where do we start this conversation on where the relationship is right now? Well, I think the first thing to realize is that there's no relationship in the world that touches the daily lives of more Americans than the relationship with Mexico. But most people don't know this. They don't appreciate how important our southern neighbor is to us. They've become our number one trading partner this year, with Canada number two and China falling down to number three. Uh, they are also they, tied to 35 million American citizens who are Mexican-Americans of origin. So there's a, a, a cultural bond. We have a 2,000-mile border. Across that border every day there are a million crossings, legal crossings, legitimate crossings, which are part of the trade and the personal relationships that tie the two countries together. Um, and then in many other ways we're just knit up closely for good and for bad, hmm. which means that one, we, have, we need to recognize all the important things that are going on that are positive, and two, we need to work together to deal with the things that are bad that are going on between the two countries. And that means investing, understanding in this relationship. And most people don't realize that. So what should we be doing to uh, understand the relationship more? What's, what's being missed by the American people? Or, or do they take it for granted because it has been such a cordial relationship for most of its history, at least from the American perspective? Well, it's very interesting. For a long time, we were called distant neighbors because though on right. the border it's been cordial quite a bit, uh, it's really been arm's length relationship between the two governments for many years. And that started to change when the North America Free Trade Agreement was signed in the early 1990s. And what we've done from then on is really build an extremely integrated, not only trading relationship, but production relationship. On average, about 40% of every manufactured product coming into the United States from Mexico is actually U.S. parts. So people don't understand this, but if a a Honda CRV, this is my wonderful example, put together in Jalisco, in Guadalajara, Mexico, mm -hmm. comes to the border. It looks like a $35,000 Mexican car. Actually, 70% of that $35,000 is from the United States or Canada mm -hmm. because we have this combined production network, especially in the auto industry, but in other areas too, where we actually make these things together. People don't realize that. So as you know, the big story about NAFTA was great sucking sounds, all the jobs are going to go away. Some jobs did go to Mexico, but other jobs were created because of the new possibilities to compete globally by using Canada and Mexico as part of this production chain. What happened was we actually created higher value jobs in the United States, and so a lot of people who lost their production line jobs that did move to Mexico did not have other opportunities to get new jobs. So people did suffer, but overall there was more wealth created in the United States than not. And just to throw out, I love facts, so throw out another fact. In 1992, when they were trying to sell NAFTA to the U.S. Congress, they pointed out there were 700,000 jobs tied to trade with Mexico. Wasn't this important? Well, in 2017, there are 4.9 million jobs, wow. seven times as many in the United States tied to trade with Mexico. So this relationship is much more important to all those millions of workers and their families and then the others that benefit from that than people realize. Um, so when it comes to, David mentioned the word cordial, I'm glad that you touched on it too because from a perspective of uh, someone who uh, has uh, a lot of um, 
Latin American influence, uh, that, that word cordial touched my heart for a second. And I'm like, is that really, is that what the Mexicans think? Uh, do, do the Mexicans perceive uh, that the Americans have this cordial relationship with Mexico uh, from your experience as an ambassador? Because my friends say something different. <laughs> Well, there's a love-hate aspect to the, to the relationship. Um, from the point of view of somebody who served as a U.S. diplomat for over 40 years, uh, in many ways I didn't feel more at home anywhere else other than Mexico because Mexicans actually share a number of preferences with Americans for things they like to do, for products they like to, to consume, uh, for television, for film, for all sorts of things. Now they have their own th their own cultural heritage also, but they like many American things. And of course, now in the United States, as we've seen over especially the past 20 years, Mexican cuisine is all over the United States and very popular, as is Mexican beer, um, in particular. But what you have interspersed in there are these periods of racial discrimination against Mexican-Americans. And it's very interesting. In, in, in different parts of the country, it, uh, it seems to me that it's gone in waves of sometimes anti-Mexican feeling, other times just fine, we're, we're working together well. I grew up in California, a lot of uh, Mexican-Americans there, Chicanos, they like to call themselves when I was growing up. And, you know, we all got along just fine. And then in the 1990s and early 2000s, when many Mexican immigrants were coming into California, especially from rural areas, there was a gap, a cultural gap, and that led to a lot of resentment from Californians at that time. Now, California has the largest number of Mexican-American elected representatives in the highest positions of that state government. So you've seen an evolution in that state's approach and their various reactions across the United States. And um, as you've seen generally, the national government, President Trump, has been very critical of Mexico publicly and otherwise. And so not surprisingly, Mexican views of the United States have become very negative um, from what was a, a relative high point in 2016. They dropped uh, significantly in 2017 and 2018. Um, and are sort of mixed at present. So you do have this, you know, I love many things about you, but I don't like the way you treat me perspective um, from Mexico. And what do you think would change that perception that you mentioned? Well, I think if we can move back to a set of accepted rules for working together on the border, uh, for dealing with difficult problems like migration and crime, um, for getting the agreement on trade and commerce settled and again start working on building better possibilities for both countries, that will help change that perspective. Of course, the biggest uh, change will come if there are not a stream of criticisms coming from one country toward the other. Um, Lopez Obrador, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, the new president of Mexico, has been very careful as to how he's been treating uh, the criticisms that have come from the United States. He's responded to them in a principled way, but not in a personal way in any sense. And he's tried to find ways to work together and, and move forward, um, even with the United States expressing its unhappiness with certain things that are happening in Mexico. And I think it's fair to say that there are grounds for unhappiness with the ways some things are happening in Mexico. But if we can get back to the path of trying to work together, accepting we have shared responsibilities and shared solutions that we're trying to build together, that will help deal with uh, this resentment. Of course, you still have how migrants who are non-Mexicans are also being treated in the United States. They are viewed with great sympathy in, in Mexico. Um, and that relate, remains an unanswered set of questions. When you look at, at, at the immigration and the war on drugs in particular, what is it that each side is doing correctly and what is it that each side needs to actually address themselves? And, and one of the things I, I would just add editorial comment is there's a tendency for 
you know, us in the United States to look at other countries and say they're not doing this, this, and this, but what are we not doing? What are we missing? Certainly. Well, I think first there's a, there is a correct basis from the United States. We have a set of laws for legal, normal immigration, and those have not been, are not being enforced, followed correctly for a lot of reasons for a long time, one of which goes back to the United States Congress. They have not been able to pass an immigration reform for a long time, and that's Congress and the administration working together, and so our laws have not been updated. Also, our migration services have not been funded well in, the, in various parts of it. The Border Patrol has been funded well, but the judges who make decisions on asylum cases, um, have, there aren't enough of them. They, that whole process hasn't been funded sufficiently. And as we've seen over the last year, the facilities for caring for people who come in and are stopped are not well-funded either. So there's a lot on the U.S. side. On the Mexican side, they really have not invested in their migration services, in their asylum services. They don't have shelters uh, nearly sufficient for the people that have been coming for many years, let alone for the surge that came from Central America over the past 18 months. And they really need to invest in making that better over the long run. Um, what we've seen in recent months, in response to U.S. complaints, is that the Mexicans have stepped up their efforts to enforce their own rules and, and not just let people come in and pass through their country, arrive at our border. And um, that is good. And now the challenge is, one, make that sustainable in Mexico, and two, for the United States and Mexico to work with the Central American countries to really address the problems that are causing these people to flee. People just don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I want to go to the United States. Let's walk 1,500 miles right. through right. crime-infested areas to get to the United States. They do that because for various reasons, and it differs in different countries and different areas, they feel they can't sustain their lives where they are. So part of the long-term solution has to be working with those governments to find solutions to the crime, to the lack of economic opportunity, and, and other causes that are pushing people to leave. So there's a whole chain which uh, you can follow the migrants that needs to be addressed and needs to be improved, and that includes United States, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. Um, and it's, it's a big problem, there's no question about that. And drugs is a similarly difficult area. There's a whole chain that goes from producing the drugs, if it's a synthetic drug, importing the chemicals, putting it together, shipping it to the United States border, it gets across the U.S. border, and then it gets to Chicago or Boston. It doesn't get catapulted from Mexico right. into those cities. So there's a whole chain you have to look at. And then when it's sold in the United States, somehow that money gets back to those cartels. The estimates are 19 to $30 billion a year those cartels make. And they uh, use some of that money to buy arms in the United States and ship, uh, ship them back illegally across the border. They use other of that money to, to pay for their whole organization and to buy officials along the way. So this needs common work, needs a common solution. And the two governments have to work together very hard. It's not easy. It's a really complex and, set and of issues. You're pointing out, you know, complex problems that you can look at guns, you can look at drugs, you can look at money laundering. Just in, you know, in mentioning the the the, the drug aspect of this, and similarly on the immigration side, there's a lot of different different areas there. You mentioned earlier about how Mexico is responding to some of President Trump's very public criticism. In working with the Mexican government, how did you find that they, you know, what was the best approach to take with Mexico? Well, where we made a lot of progress was first by agreeing on a redefinition of the problems in a sense. The problems were, uh, co they were shared and that it wasn't one side or the other that had to, that got either the total blame or came up, come up with all the solutions. Okay. You had to do it together. And once we did that, we could then hammer out steps to make concrete progress. 
And before that, which I saw when I first got to Mexico early on, people were still pointing across the border and, you know, well, you're not doing this and, well, you're not doing that. And there wasn't much progress being made. When we got over that, we took a lot of steps forward and we actually got to a very advanced state of cooperation. We hadn't solved everything, but we were solving little bits along the way. And the problem over the past couple of years is that we've gotten away from that. It takes mutual trust to be able to solve problems together. Now, there are problems being solved. I give credit where credit is due. Uh, you did, President Trump did get the attention of the Mexicans when he threatened to put tariffs on all their exports. Uh, they did step up their enforcement efforts, and they have um, reduced significantly the number of Central Americans arriving at the U.S. border. But now that has to be made sustainable and has to be turned into regular practices and regular cooperation. And as I said, this investment in the places that are really the sources of, of the people leaving. You have to invest there so they don't keep leaving. And that, I believe, is going to take getting back to having confidence in each other, um, seeing this as a shared problem, that it is in your interest to solve together. How do you feel about the wall? <clears throat> Excuse me, the wall. Um, I honestly never felt the law, or the wall was a, a solution to the problem, uh, especially along the whole border. In certain places, a wall makes sense where the buildings are right up next to each other and there's a very high uh, population density. It does make sense to have a barrier uh, that makes it harder for people, especially to throw drugs over or do other things. Not so much for right. illegal. Uh, migration as much as it is for other illegal commerce that can go one way or the other. And in fact, most drugs are thought to come in, are believed to come into the country through those legal checkpoints. They get smuggled through on trains or cars or buses. Sure. And so it makes a lot of sense to use better technology, to use better barriers, and then funnel everybody to where you can actually see what's going on. And the, the neat thing is with new technologies, you could now catch most of the illegal substances or guns or bulk money by just having scanners that people walk through um, or drive through, in a, you know, slowly, sure. but you don't have to be pulled aside and it will go off and then you get pulled aside. And if we deployed those on both sides of the border, you could be very effective. Um, I also think that new technology should help along the border where there is no wall and that it just seemed to me like an unneeded expense and, uh, and problem to try and build a wall along that, that whole frontier. It was, as, as many people have said, it, it was a, uh, a solution of a few centuries ago, perhaps, to a problem that we can solve differently today. Well, do, you think, oh, go ahead. Uh, do you think President Trump and Lopez Obrador are working together a little bit more, uh, or do you think that that needs improvement? Well, they are working together surprisingly well, much better than people thought when Lopez Obrador was elected because he is an avowed reformist. Some people think he's left of center. Some people say, no, he's, he's, uh, you know, he's really not that left, but he is a reformist. But for whatever reason, Lopez Obrador has recognized that he needs to have a good relationship with the United States. They buy 80% of Mexico's production. And so it is tremendously important. Um, there are many Mexican-Americans who still have ties to Mexico, and, and so they send remittances home to family and others that make a big difference in Mexico. So he's worked hard to maintain this good relationship, the, the biggest evidence of which is their response to the migration issue, which they, they indirectly admitted they were not doing a very good job of screening people, uh, which they weren't, and they're now doing a much better job of doing that. Let me ask you, you said so 80% of Mexican production is going to trade towards the United States. How effective have, has NAFTA and, and this trade been on in, in boosting uh, Mexican economy? And how has that you know, made a difference in terms of Mexican society overall? Or is there still uh, way too much imbalance in terms of the winners and losers? Uh, yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, U.S.-Mexico trade has grown about six times 
since the beginning, the first, since NAFTA went into effect. So that was in 1994. Um, so that's a lot of growth in trade. During that period of time, there's been a lot of wealth created in Mexico. Most of that wealth, however, has gone to the north of Mexico, where new factories were built and where much of the trade takes place. And then somewhat down into the center of Mexico, but the south and the southwest of Mexico have not benefited. And that is was one of the planks on which Lopez Obrador was elected. Um, he argued that too much of the wealth in the country was going to the wealthy elites and to certain parts of, that, of, of the nation, and that needed to be spread more widely. And so that, that is the aim of a number of the reforms that he has tried to put in place. We'll have to see whether or not that's going to work. He's having some challenges getting growth going. But what is working still is this production machine that the private sector has built between Mexico and the United States. And that is one of the strong pillars of Mexico's economy, just as it is one of the important pillars of our own economy. And another important thing to remember it isn't all about manufacturing. Mexico is the number three export market for American farmers, so they depend a lot on selling things to Mexico. And Mexico, over these 25 years, has become a big supplier of fruits and vegetables to the United States, which they were not before, the most famous of which are avocados, and especially around Super Bowl time, everybody <laughs> talks about that. But your gra grapes and berries and, and all sorts of other products uh, now come from Mexico, especially off-season, um, and not always off-season, which why Florida growers aren't always too happy with uh, Mexican tomatoes, for example, is one of the uh, recent points of, of difference. But it has been a boon for consumers in the United States and for parts of the agricultural sector in Mexico after they went through a very difficult adjustment in Mexico in their agricultural sector to become more modern. Do the farm working communities in Mexico uh, communicate with the farm working communities in, uh, in the United States? Well, they do a little bit because we do have a temporary worker program that is a, actually a legal program where, they, where uh, Mexican workers will come up and work on different agricultural enterprises in the United States. So there is a communication there. But there's not a great communication uh, between them. I mean, if Mexican Americans are in these organizations in the United States, that is an indirect communication. But there's not, an or, there's not a strong organized communication across the border between workers' unions. Uh, one of the big issues in this new trade agreement, in fact, is how much reform would Mexico put in place so their workers could actually freely organize unions in Mexico because the previous system had uh, basically allowed company control over the unions that were set up. So the, the new government, Lopez Obrador's government, has passed a massive labor reform um, which has all the right goals and objectives there, it now needs to be implemented. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be a big challenge because hundreds of thousands of individual contracts are going to have to be re-voted over the next several years in a newly uh, open, more open system and they have to set up a whole new set of, of courts when there are complaints to actually judge these complaints. So there's a lot to do. And American labor is uh, is the force expressing great concern about the new treaty because they want to make sure uh, this is really fixed and it works. One of the things you mentioned um, briefly, if you can touch on, you said that Lopez Obrador uh, wanted to spread the wealth. That doesn't sound like a democracy to me, but if you can kind of go into that quickly. Well, I think it's somewhat, it, it's not too much different than what a number of Democrats in the United States argued, that you need to change uh, the opportunities for making and retaining money. And in fact, um, Lopez Obrador has not put forward uh, as radical tax reforms, for example, as a number of the Democrat candidates in the United States. Uh, his arguments are that through different social programs, 
Um, and a program, for example, he, he's calling, uh, which is aimed at youth, to give youth new opportunities. He's targeting those young people who are neither in school nor employed, and he's giving them a one-year internship with a, a local company where the state pays a stipend for them, basically. He hopes he can break them into the employment market and they will stay in that market. Um, and uh, But he has not yet introduced anything for radical tax reform. He just believes by some government programs he can give poor people greater opportunities to get into the mainstream. Right. Well, we are, we are running low on time. One, one very quick question, which is, if they don't, if con the U.S. Congress doesn't pass this new agreement, what happens? Is NAFTA no one void, or is it still in existence? No, NAFTA continues until it's revoked, and there's a little bit of a dispute. President Trump says he has the power to revoke it. Congress says, no, you have to have congressional approval because we passed laws as part of the approval of this agreement. The, but from the business community perspective and the farm community, what they really want is certainty and predictability. That's why they are very strongly pushing for approval of the new agreement. If the new agreement goes away, NAFTA will still provide a degree of that certainty. If there's a move to call to revoke NAFTA, that would really send shockwaves through the U.S. economy as well as the economies of Canada and Mexico. Ambassador Tony Wayne, thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again soon on another episode of Global Perspectives. <music>